I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that is where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can, get organized and follow the recipe. That way, you'll be sure to get wonderful results. Moroccan Herrera soup sounds very exotic, but in fact it's made with easily available ingredients. Lamb, chickpeas, lentils, tomatoes, onions, ginger, turmeric, coriander. In Morocco, the soup is traditionally served to break the fast during the holy month of Ramadan, and it can honestly be described as a meal in a bowl. But it's also surprisingly light, and can be served in smaller portions as a starter, which is what I'm doing today. There are thousands of different recipes, with each household adding its own unique twist. This is my version, and I really love it. So, I've got everything measured out in front of me, and I've got my chickpeas here. So, I like to use dried chickpeas, so I soak them overnight in cold water, and they swell up to double, sometimes treble in size, and then you discard that water. You could use tin chickpeas here as well, which are already cooked, but I prefer to start with the dried ones. Um, lentils, and lamb, onions, and spices. So, pretty much everything goes into the saucepan at the same time. So, chickpeas going in first. And then the lentils. I'm using little Puy lentils, which come from a place called Puy, P-U-Y in France. You could use, these are little sort of speckled lentils. You could use green lentils. You could probably use orange lentils here, but I like the colour and the flavour of these. So they go in. Now, next is my lamb. So I've got a little dice of shoulder of lamb. It could be leg for that matter as well. So we've diced it up really nice and small, like that. And um, we've removed all of the fat. So just very, very simple and straightforward. And then the onions. So nice, fairly finely diced onions. This is all going to cook very slowly at a very, very gentle simmer. And the idea is we have a lovely sort of hodgepodge, a mishmash, a tangle of all sorts of different ingredients at the end. I've got beautiful saffron-coloured turmeric, which brings its own sort of slightly smoky flavour. I've got some ground cinnamon, some ground ginger for a little bit of sort of piquancy. Then we have true saffron here. Um, saffron is grown all over the world, but a lot of saffron and very good saffron is produced in Morocco. And finally, paprika with its slightly mysterious flavor. So the whole blend together add for a lovely combination. Now the spices are in, an essential pinch of salt and pepper. And then the liquid in this soup, interestingly, is water. And I once made this using chicken stock, thinking it would be much more interesting, more flavoursome, but I actually didn't find there was any improvement, and I prefer it when it's made with water. Now, when you put the water in, it looks like this watery broth with various just sort of random little bits and pieces in it, but don't worry, when it starts to cook, it all starts to look really, really lovely. So all we do now is put the heat under that. Meanwhile, I can be cooking the rice and I've got a little bit of long grain basmati like that, absolutely lovely. I'm just going to cook it in a little bit of simmering water. So I've got a bit of water on here. So I'm going to pop that in. So give the rice a gentle little stir just to loosen the grains from one another. And I'm going to cook the rice until it's just al dente. OK, I'm happy that the rice is cooked, just grains looking lovely and tender. So I want to strain that straight away. It's very important I don't overcook it. And also, it's important that I remember to save a little of the rice cooking water, because that's what we're going to use for the tomatoes. Put that in there. And we're going to save that rice for later on. This goes into the soup towards the end of cooking. If you put the rice in now, it would end up being very, very overcooked. Take a little of the rice cooking water, this seems strange, but this is the way it's done. Just a little. And that sort of helps to add a little bit of liquid, obviously, for the, um, the gentle cooking and the gentle heating of the diced, peeled tomato. A pinch of sugar, definitely, and salt. A pinch of sugar, not to make it overly sweet, but just to lift the flavour of the tomatoes. 
just going to warm those up gently. I don't want to reduce those to a pulp either, so it's nice if they hold the little shape that I've cut them in after I peeled them and de them. Now, the soup has come to a simmer and suddenly the room is full of the smell and the aromas of North Africa. So what I want to do is to just skim off a little of the froth of the top of the soup. Now, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, but it makes the finished soup at the end just slightly more refined in appearance. So we have most of the work done here now because this is just going to simmer away until the chickpeas are tender, the lamb is tender, and the lentils are tender. I think that's pretty good. You know, you're not going to get every little last little bit of froth off, and that's not the end of the world at all. Brilliant. Now, my tomatoes I'm going to turn off now because they've just been simmering away there for a couple of minutes. So all I've been doing is warming them slightly, really to bring out the flavor and to tenderize them ever so slightly. So I can turn the heat off under those and leave those sitting. Now, a little bit of butter going in at this stage. We put half the butter in curiously now, and that obviously brings a lovely enrichment. And then the rest of the butter goes in with the rice and the tomatoes later on. The Herrera has been simmering away nice and gently, and let's have a look and see how it's doing. It's looking terrific at this stage. The saffron has stained the color of the lamb and the chickpeas give that lovely sort of gentle hue, which is really nice. To finish, just put in the rest of my ingredients. So the tomatoes that we cooked in a little bit of the rice water, they go in. The refreshing parsley and coriander. And then um, the cooked rice. We'll pop that in and tap and then a nice gentle stir. And you can see now the way suddenly it's been absolutely transformed into what almost looks like a stew, really. Okay, ready to serve. All those fantastic things in the bowl. Um, I sometimes serve a wedge of lemon with this, as they would do in Morocco and North Africa, particularly when the weather is really warm and has a really refreshing effect. I think it's fair to say that there's definitely eating and drinking in the soup. This is something I really, really love. A simple piece of fish, beautifully cooked, is one of my favorite things. And there are so many ways to cook fish, each one adding to the versatility of an ingredient which, as a nation, we eat far too little of. Other nations appreciate perhaps what we don't, our cool, unpolluted waters which deliver an abundance of utterly delicious food, including the less than glamorous haddock. Haddock is wonderful and tastes far better than more fashionable sanding species which are sometimes farmed, frozen and shipped here from far away. When you marry the haddock with assertive accompaniments like I'm going to do today, cook it really quickly in a hot oven, you have a spectacular dish. Now, there are lots of things which are wonderful to add to a mashed potato. Obvious things like scallions or leeks. What may seem a bit unusual is what I'm going to use today, which is a courgette. I'm going to pair it with some garlic, a uh, little chilli, and some ground fennel seeds. And this is a lovely southern Italian combination of flavours. The herb of choice is marjoram. This is the herb that's perfectly suited to go with the three of these. OK, so I can prepare my courgette to slice a little off the bottom and off the top. And because this is a big courgette, I'm just going to cut it in half lengthways and lengthways again, like that. And I'm going to take some of the excess seed out of the middle, OK? Because that's just quite watery. And those seeds there really just break down into a watery liquid. I like to cut them fairly finely for this particular recipe. Get your pan nice and hot and add a couple of tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. OK, that's my olive oil. I want to make sure the olive oil is hot enough before I put my seasonings in. So my thinly sliced garlic, which is very, very thinly sliced, I'm just going to drop in one little bit and I want to hear it sizzling. And you can see it sizzling there, so I know that I can straight away add in the rest of the garlic. Like that. And straight away, not all of this chilli, a pinch of the chilli and my fennel seeds. And there are certain combinations of flavour when you introduce them to heat in a frying pan that have just the most incredible aroma. This is one of them. 
Okay, now I don't want to over toast anything, so just get a little bit of color on the garlic. So straight away, don't burn the garlic, add in your courgettes. So you need to be ready to go with this. Apart from what I'm doing today, adding them to the potatoes to make a fantastic mashed potato, courgettes or zucchini cooked in this way to serve as a vegetable are absolutely fantastic. Now, turn those around. Very importantly, a pinch of salt, twist of pepper, and keep turning them like that. So I want these to cook until they get a little bit of colour. And then I'm going to turn off the heat. And unusually, I'm going to put a lid on the pan because I want them to get a bit of colour, but I also want them to soften slightly. Now, let's not forget to put in our chopped marjoram. So I'm putting in some of the marjoram in there with the uh, courgettes. The rest of the marjoram will go in when I'm adding them to the mashed potatoes a little bit later on. Lovely, that's perfect. I'm going to turn the heat off under those. And again, as I said, unusually, put a lid on. And they'll stay nice and warm while I'm preparing. my fish and my salsa and my green vegetable. So for the little salsa, I'm doing a roast pepper and olive salsa. So I've chopped my olives, but before you chop your olives, you're going to have to remove the stones. I prefer to buy olives with the stones in, because no doubt about it, they're more flavoursome that way. So the simplest way, in my opinion, to remove the stone from an olive is to just press it like that, and then the olive just pops out really easily. It's absolutely as simple as pie. And then just go over them like that and give them a, a chop. OK, that's the olives. I've also got a little bit of crushed garlic, so crushed to a paste so it's going to disappear into this uh, salsa. And then the other thing I need is some roast pepper. So I have my peeled and my roasted and peeled peppers. Um, and I'm just going to cut them into little strips like this. And then I'm going to cut them into nice, fine dice. Right. So, mix everything together. The diced pepper, the chopped olive. So it's quite strongly flavoured, but really delicious. The crushed garlic. A little sprinkle of salt. And a twist of pepper. A drizzle of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. A few little drops of balsamic vinegar, so don't overdo it. I just want to lift it with the vinegar. Literally a few little drops. And then the herb here I'm going to use is basil. I don't want to chop it too finely because I want to come across a nice hit of basil every now and then. So slightly, you could say fairly that that's coarsely chopped. 
mix it all together, making sure to break up the garlic so nobody comes across the garlic uh, in one piece, because that would be a terrible shock and it certainly would not taste nice. Absolutely fantastic. Lovely. Now, my fish. So I've got some beautiful fresh haddock here, which has been filleted, and I'm going to cook it on some parchment paper, so it will slide off the parchment paper really, really easily. So, um, a little drizzle of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Put on less than you think you need. Just a little like that. What I like to do then is to just use a little brush. Pinch of salt, like that. And now some pepper. Lovely, okay. And straight into a good hot oven, nearly the hottest oven you have. We want the heat here to be fierce. Um, and then it will go through the thinnish fillet of fish and cook it really nice and quickly. It couldn't be easier. It's a beautiful way to cook fish like this. Romanesco is an extraordinary looking vegetable. It's a member of the cauliflower family and is prepared and cooked in exactly the same way as the conventional cauliflower. Start by cutting off the outside leaves, but don't discard them. These will be cooked. Cut off the tough stalk. Then cut a cone-shaped piece out of the base of the vegetable. Break or cut the remaining Romanesco into smaller pieces. Chop the leaves nice and finely and place them into your saucepan of boiling salted water. Add in the remaining vegetable on top of the leaves. Bring the water back to the boil and cook for five or six minutes or until just tender. Let's have a little look at our fish to see how it's doing. Oh, yeah. Ooh. You can see how hot the oven is. My little tray did a little jump and a buckle there. Now, this is cooked. Pretty much sure this is cooked. OK, how do we know it's cooked? Just go into the thickest part of the fish there and you can see it no longer looks translucent. It just looks absolutely deliciously juicy. Serve the fish as soon as it comes out of the oven. The Romanesco, cooked al dente, adds great flavour but also visual interest. I always think it looks like something that comes out of the sea, so our fish should feel right at home. And finally, a roast pepper and olive salsa adds a sophisticated flourish to an otherwise simple dish. Okay, suddenly, with the red pepper and the olive and the, the sort of bright green and the various different shades of green, it's all looking a little bit Christmassy. But I'd be happy to eat this at any time of the year. I love puddings that can be made in advance and served either warm or at room temperature. The other dishes in today's suggested menu, the Moroccan soup and the roast haddock, have been light, so we can afford to have something rich and still achieve a lovely balanced meal. The chocolate prune and armagnac pudding is certainly rich and scrumptious, and the combination of ingredients is a classic one, but it absolutely has timeless appeal. The chocolate and butter of my chocolate prune and armagnac pudding is just melting nicely there, so I'm going to take it off the heat for a moment and you get what already looks like a beautiful, shiny, glossy sauce. OK, we'll leave that there just for a moment. I can either cook it as one large pudding, like that, or I could cook it all in little individual puddings like that, which can be served from the mould, or these could be teacups for that matter, or I can turn them out if you want to make a lovely individual sort of kind of special presentation. What I've done with the individual ones, I've just brushed them lightly with a little butter so the pudding will turn out nice and easily. And to be sure, to be sure, which is sometimes quite useful in the kitchen, I've put in a little disc of parchment paper into the bottom. So there should be no difficulty turning these out later on. So that's perfect. Meanwhile, um, over here I've got my prunes. Now, um, I've soaked these prunes overnight in armagnac, or you could use cognac for that matter if you want to. So with my prunes, what I like to do is to just tear them into slightly smaller pieces. Prunes are one of those things, you know, either love them or loathe them. Um, there's usually not too many people who sort of sit mid-ground on the whole prune thing. Place a handful of prunes in the individual servings and then scatter the rest over the bottom of the larger tray. 
separate your eggs. And the good thing about this recipe is that we get to use both parts of the egg. Add a generous pinch of cream of tartar to the egg whites and whisk vigorously until stiff peaks are formed. Beautiful. My chocolate should be ready to go. So just give it a little stir like that and the chocolate should be completely mixed through with the butter, so that's perfect. I can quite simply start to add in my other ingredients one after the other. So my slightly warm water, my sugar, the vanilla extract, which is the pure stuff, put that in, and give those a whisk. That's looking lovely and the egg yolks, so the egg yolks are going to enrich. And when you add the egg yolks in, you'll see them starting to thicken up the mixture. It becomes like a sort of a thicker chocolate sauce. It also gets shinier as the richness of the eggs gets mixed through. Sieve in your flour. Now fold it into the mixture carefully and thoroughly. This binds everything together. And then our final addition to lighten our egg whites. I've added in a quarter of the egg whites, thereabouts, and that just softens up the mixture before I add the remaining three quarters. So it's preparing the chocolate for the greater volume of egg whites. Add the rest of your egg whites and gently fold them through, turning the bowl as you go. Keep folding until all of the egg white has been incorporated and you have a silky, smooth chocolate mixture. Spoon the mixture into your serving dishes being careful not to overfill, as the egg in the mixture will cause it to expand. That's now ready to go into my preheated oven. So I have my water. I brought my kettle um, up to the boil, and I'm going to fill the water to halfway up along our containers. That protects the containers from the direct heat of the oven. In like that, start them off cooking them for 10 minutes, then we'll turn down the temperature and cook them for the rest of the time. So the pudding has been resting for about 10 minutes. I like to serve it warm but not red hot from the oven. I find the flavour of the chocolate is better that way. So just pop it out like that. Don't forget about the little disc of parchment paper because that would come as a terrible shock. It needs the little dusting of icing sugar just before you're going to serve it. And then you serve your cream and your chocolate sauce separately. If you're doing individual ones, you can do the whole thing on the plate. Some chocolate sauce. Lovely. And finally, what really is the perfect accompaniment here is a little dollop of softly whipped cream. So, ice cold cream, chocolate, prune-filled pudding with a little hit of Armagnac, mahogany-coloured chocolate sauce, chocolate heaven.